Life in the law, huh? the two o'clock block here on a given Friday. <laughs> Lisa Anderson, one of our hosts, our OC16 host is here. And Keisha King is one of our OC16 hosts and more. She's here. Indeed. And uh, she's my co-host today. And Elisa, yes, uh, Elisa is our guest today. And uh, we're going to talk about going to law school because everybody needs to know how to go to law school. You know, if you want to, if you want to abide by the rule of law, be a lawyer <laughs> or at least care about it. Well, not necessarily. No, Kim Kardashian's getting a law degree in the same year that I probably will be uh, with no law school. She gets more hits than Donald Trump. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's she mad does. at her for that reason. Wow. Indeed, they're in competition. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, anyway, she's going to law school without law. She's getting a law degree without law school because certain states allow you to do that, like are, California. Are you going to a uh, law school that's cold or something? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm wearing this is I'm wearing a lot of different garb from various law schools because I wanted to exemplify the we ridiculous. Are impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so I have my gloves. If you can't see, say NYU Law. My sunglasses here say Georgetown Law. This is Virginia, USC, and Duke. Anyway, this is as much as much uh, bling as I could fit on. But law the point of it, the point of it is that this in this day and age we've gotten to a ridiculous point where. People apply to too many law schools. There's so much redundancy in the American law school application process. I mean, the average student, I think, applies to about eight. Many, many people apply to more than 10. Many people actually apply to more than 40. It's ridiculous. That's expensive. It's very yeah, expensive. Yeah, it can be expensive. When you think about the applications, I say, being from Virginia, you should only consider schools in Virginia. <laughs> I don't you understand know. why you would go anywhere it's else. It's a very good law school, <laughs> they actually, are. Keisha. It, it is. is a very good law Trust school. me, I know. <laughs> the only thing is, it's in Charlottesville. Not so great a city. Problem. Yeah, a little problem problematic. There's a lot of laws you can practice yeah. correcting in Charlottesville there if you know. were to go. So. Act activist law in yes. Charlottesville. We there you go. <laughs> Needs a lot of help. So why are you going to law school, Lisa? I need to know. So I've been out of college for 10 years now. Finished that uh, eternity ago. And I've been... It's the gap 10 years. Then. <laughs> the gap is? 10 years. It the used to be a one-year gap. Now it's a gap decade. decade. Gap decade, yeah. <laughs> I feel a lot more prepared for law school now than I did just emotionally and life-wise than That's I would true. have Some of the best lawyers ago. I know entered law school uh, after they had some time, you know, following college graduation. Yeah, I, I know people who go to law school in their 40s, 50s, I mean, multiple people, and, it's, and they enjoy it a lot more, too. And I personally think I would have gotten much too caught up in grades and test scores and maybe the social drama of law school back then. Now I feel like I'm doing it because I want to learn the law. I have worked in a variety of industries um, since college, and the law is the common thread going throughout them. Yeah, yeah. I like, basically, I just like the thinking of a lawyer. I um, enjoy that sort of mathematical approach to logic and applying our, what we need in our society to sort of the, a, a consistent procedural framework. Was there something that happened in the last 10 years in, in current events that makes you more interested in the rule of law and that kind of logic <laughs> that you're talking about? Well, current events are definitely make me more interested in it, and it's really a tool to use, you know, towards correcting future current events. Um, I think we're at a point where we're not thinking very sanely from either extreme politically or, you know, in many decisions. Um, I, there's not one one episode. I've been involved at the state legislature repeatedly, um, not not recently, but um, for, I've worked for a number of legislators, both parties, both chambers gotten some exposure to elections and media nationwide, and um, I just, I think the law is the common thread. So you want to do good with it, or you want to do power do and influence well. <laughs> with it, or you want to make money with it? What do you want with it? Oh, everything. We'll see. I'm not, I'm not prescribing my, my limits quite yet. I mean, I, I'm not terribly drawn to big law, and um, as you probably know, there's a massive gap in salaries between big law and, say, public interest. We're talking straight out of law school, you can make about $200,000 in big law, which is firms of typically over 500 people. You can't do that in Hawaii big law, but on the mainland easily. And then um, government pays about 50 grand straight out. So there's like disparity. a four-fold four disparity. Yeah. Disparity it's has grown because that 50 grand was the same 10 years ago. Wow. Uh, the 200 grand was not the same 10 years ago. So it's, it's like the economy mm. in general. Mm. It's like disparity in general. Economic disparity uh, hits the law profession, yeah. I must say. It's very... And, and it's hard to justify that if you want to know. 
Yeah. Well, why is the graduate who goes into public interest law, you know, making 25% of what the graduate who, yeah. you know, and by the way, some top of the line graduates go into public interest law. Yeah, for sure. And certain, certain branches of public interest law are actually in at least as much demand. For instance, a lot of people want to work for organizations like the ACLU or federal clerkships, and that's a whole nother beast because that's super competitive, except you don't make much money straight off, except oftentimes if you work for a federal judge for a couple years, you know, you start your first year at the big law firm, you'll be making, say, a third year salary if you spent two years working for the federal give you credit judge. For so it. they give you credit, but you still make pennies while you're working for the federal judge, but yet it's very competitive. Keisha, does this make you want to go to law school? It does not, but it does make me more interested and appreciative of those who go into public law. My question for you, though, is what experience did you gain over the past 10 years that now gives you uh, kind of an insight on what you want to do? Um, I guess, let's see, there's not, there's not one particular experience, but um, I think in general my work at the state capitol and... Um, what did you do there? So I worked for um, a Democrat senator and two, I mean, a de yeah, Democrat state senator and two Republicans, one state senator, one state representative. And I just, I noticed a lot of just factionalism. And, and I also worked for a conservative national radio host more recently, and um, that, that radio host was thrown off the airways because he wasn't conservative enough. He was on a conservative station. And he was replaced by a, a fellow who actually illegally came to work in the Trump administration because that fellow is a lot more conservative. So, you know, if you, if you run the middle of the road, there's really no, no, outlet, no solution. You know, people will attack you for not being conservative enough from the conservative side. Of course, you're going to get attacked from the liberal side because you're not a liberal and then you're just floundering. And it's a really dangerous place for our society because um, we, we need people who can entertain both sides and who can actually make compromises. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the current climate's very, very hostile to compromises. I also worked on the campaign of a Hawaii U.S. congressman um, last year, who's who's very much about as middle of the road as you can get in Hawaii, and he gets he's getting attacked right now from both sides for statements about the border and about Trump. You know, people say, "Oh, you're too pro-Trump. Oh, you're too anti-Trump," and you know, there's there's no room for dialogue, and I think that's very important. So I'm going to be going to um, law school in Washington D.C., and I think that that political angle interests me, but it's not the be-all, end-all. I'm also interested in estate law and potentially entertainment law, uh, international law, which of course okay, is so you're not, I mean, Some people are pointed directly at running for office. No, I'm not. Uh, not <laughs> you're not, okay, good. Good no. to hear that. On the other hand, um, you know, your political awareness, your political consciousness is important and will undoubtedly be enhanced. And you will come out of there feeling maybe um, you know, more on the rule of law than you would otherwise. Yeah, uh, I'll hopefully have a more a uh, cooled approach to it. I, I, I think that we get too easily heated when we talk about politics. And I think a lawyer's job is to step back a little bit and look at the objectives. And that's something I hope to gain. Yeah. Well, uh, Jim Duffy made a comment at a bar association meeting. I, I won't forget. He said, you know, doctors, uh, they hear the, the body. Mm -hmm. um, men of the cloth, women of the cloth, uh, they heal the spirit. And lawyers, they heal the controversy. <laughs> Oh, well, that's the. Good. You want to say that's the goal? You want to say? Really, thank you. Not really convinced. What school have you chosen in D.C.? Ah, uh, Georgetown. Very Georgetown. good school. Very so. good school. I have five lawyers in our family who oh. went to Georgetown. All five went to Georgetown. Five. There wow. are others who went other places. Oh wow! Yeah. Georgetown Law School or undergraduate or both? Both. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. Interesting. That's a good school. Yeah. It's a very good school. Yeah. Good. I was not in that number of people. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. was your experience like, Elise? Well, um, I thought about law school straight out of college. I didn't apply, and I'm glad that I didn't. And This was my first year applying, but um, one thing that helped me apply this year was the fact that I got seriously injured. I had an um, ACL injury. I was playing oh. tennis one day, and I, um, my leg like just buckled. Is that like an ACLU injury? <laughs> no. <Nah. laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Yeah, my, um, my ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, just snapped all of a sudden, so I couldn't walk. I had to get knee surgery. for. I still I used to be an avid runner. I used to run um, for about 30 minutes to an hour every single day. It was a very, very important part of my life. 
all of a sudden I couldn't I couldn't walk, much less run. I haven't run now in about eight months, maybe nine months. Mm. Jay, Jay knows this. We live on I the know, same neighborhood. I know they're watching week so. to week out in the recovery here. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so yeah, I my life changed. I didn't have certain activities I could do anymore, and um, that gave me the focus and the discipline to finally apply to law school. And I did, so I injured my knee in October, and um, the, I, had, I had already gotten the recommendations going. I hadn't actually filled out any applications yet. I'd taken one LSAT, but um, I can't say for sure that I would have had the focus to go through the process if I hadn't hurt my knee, because once I did that, I couldn't do anything. I was lying in bed all day long. I actually had the ambulance come on Thanksgiving because there was something. It was it was very serious an incident, yeah. Yeah. and um, I mean I I was people don't like me to call myself a cripple because they think that's insulting to actual cripples. But I I really was crippled for many. Um, for, I still am, but um, because I couldn't do much actively, I couldn't hike, I couldn't play tennis, couldn't travel like I would have liked to. Um, I was I was forced to focus. So you had and to focus and maybe refocus your it life. It was a huh? silver lining, for yeah. sure. I, I, I got those applications done for about a three-week period. I did absolutely nothing but applications. I applied to 15 law schools, um, which I well, think was overkill. Anyway. Yeah. It's not 40, <laughs> but it was too many. See, what they do, if you do pretty well on the LSAT, a lot of the schools are going to give you application fee waivers. So most applications cost about $120 each application because you have a $45 processing fee for the central organization then the school itself charges anywhere between usually 60 and 90 dollars for its fee so the waivers waive the school side of the fee but you still pay the $45 portion so if you apply you know to 15 schools without any waivers multiply that by you know 120 and that's about as much money as you're mm. spending just on the applications, the applications are similar though you said before they were redundant huh? Um, they are similar, but they're different enough that you have to read every one. You can't just, you know, put copy paste. Careful. Yeah, because yeah, they have different word limits. They have slightly different questions, different focuses, um, different rules sometimes. Some will ask you for sections that others don't. You know, some care, say, where your family went to school or how much money your parents make or, you know, those kinds of things. Really? Is there anything on there that sticks in your mind as being damn stupid? <laughs> <laughs> a lot is on there that I think is damn stupid, and I have some um, some charts here that I um, that we can well, let's look on. at them. Let's look at the charts. Yeah. So one Take a one critical thing, look at the, all of this. So I, the charts all kind of look the same, and this is from um, LawSchoolNumbers.com. I don't know how much you can see. I'm very bad nearsighted, so um, you can see green dots in the upper right corner, then a line of yellow, then a sea of red. And um, that indicates that's by, on the horizontal axis, you have um, LSAT score. On the vertical axis, you have GPA. So that indicates how people get accepted, uh, waitlisted, or rejected from law school, green, yellow, red, respectively. And um, it's very, very cut and dry. You know, they put so much emphasis on essays and the factors of what you've been doing with your life. But in the end, you can see that the dots are pretty conform to, you know, your grades and your test scores, with one exception. And that's URM. So they have URM. URM, underrepresented minority. So they give significant preferences to people based on race. And if you see the charts I have, it, I highlighted certain dots so you can get in um, if race, and I, it, it's ambiguous whether sexual orientation comes into that because many claim that that's also a How URM. About religion? No, I'm quite sure that's not a URM. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I don't but think they, But they it. ask you questions about that. Mm -hmm. Do they? I'm not so How sure they, about how that. How can they measure URM if they don't know? Well, I don't think they ask about religion. They ask you, no, they do about ask race. you about I'm race. Yes, about they race. absolutely ask you about race. Okay. And so you can see that um, it does it does really help if you go to one of my charts. I have it um, on all of them. So which one, which one, can you see what that, what one is that? Harvard. So I have um, one of the, you can see one of them has URM, one of the green dots that's way into the red field. And that gives you a sense. If you scroll forward, I have Harvard and Georgetown and NYU, I believe, um, all different charts. And so on. it's almost every dot Every person that gets in with a with a um, test score and grade combination there has that URM boost. 
What do you think made you appealing on these applications? What were, what were your strong well, suits Well, if here? you look at, I didn't put where my dot is, but I was, I got a pretty strong LSAT score, so, um, I mean, I was pretty safely. Time. I took it three times. Three um, times? You're, see, is that they some only, kind of all-time record? No, it? no, oh. the all-time record would be about eight times. <laughs> okay. so, <laughs> so the first time I took it, I got in the 94th percentile, and um, that's not good, actually, for, for law school applications. Yeah, you can get into law school with a score in the 94th percentile, but um, not a great law school unless, you're, unless you have other factors going in. What were so, they? What were, what were the other factors in play? Well, I don't have them. Race, um, sexual orientation, um, yeah, poverty status, that can help a lot. Um, basically, the URM factors. And, um, but so anyway, I took it again. I had a problem during that first LSAT. If you ever take the LSAT, you have to know... You don't, this, you cannot. This is going to be in the final exam. <laughs> you cannot. Oh, you're writing this down. It's important. After checking in, if you check in 45 minutes before the test starts, you walk in the room, you cannot leave to use the bathroom until after the time starts. And I didn't understand that when I first took the test. So I had to. Some, some scrib notes or exactly. something. Exactly. You can't even bring a, a racer back into the, into the testing room. It's crazy. Modern but, technology. Yeah, but anyway, I used the bathroom in the middle of the test and got a 94th percentile score, which again, sounds pretty good, but it's not. So I took it again, got a 98th percentile score, which is, is quite good. And that can get you in, that got a lot of fee waivers that gets you into most every school, but then there are a few schools that it won't, it might not get you into. So I took it again and got the 99th percentile and that did improve. There's a big difference. Oh, wow. And that was only one point difference was 98 and 99 on the raw deal, score. It, it, it was. It raised it many. It raised the scholarships by a significant amount. What are your grades? I mean, what were your grades? Were they a big factor here? They, not only your grades, but your preparation time to prepare for the exam. For having exam. been on break for 10 years. Um, yeah, but yeah, the, right. the LSAT yeah. isn't really an academic exam. It's not, it doesn't test material that you would have learned in school. It tests like reading. It's a standardized test. Though. Yeah, what, yeah. It, what, it, what can help though with the preparation is taking multiple exams. Because when you first go in, you know, you have to put all your bags and all your stuff in a clear plastic bag. It's just very institutional. And for, the first time I took it for someone out of law school, it was... Um, it was weird. It was really strange. It was an alien experience. Then by the second, third time, it was, you know, like Old coming house. home. Yeah. When I, when I asked you about the grades, I meant your grades in college. In college. So this is something that, that I think is, here? yes, and not well. I went to Princeton for undergrad during the grade deflation policy. So I graduated in the top quarter of my class at Princeton or so, 26 percentile to be precise. So I can't lie and say I was in the top quarter. But 26 percentile or 74th in, on the good side of that. Um, at Princeton should be pretty good, but because they had a grade deflation policy, it um, knocked down the, the, it wasn't, my GPA was a 3.68, which is below the 25th percentile for most law schools, for most elite law schools. Mm. And, I'm so um, sorry for you. <laughs> it's a Speaking real sad to, story. Yeah, it's, it's a sad story. Sad. I'm sure all you people out there, you're probably sorry Don't you for feel Elise. bad for Elise? Yeah, bad, I mean, she's a, really having a it moment tough. of concern. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, the 3.68, yeah, it's not, it's not good. Most have like an um, average of about 3.85. That's kind of the mean average for law school applications. And they don't care that much where you went to school or even if it had a grade deflation policy at the time. So, um, yeah, it was, that, that worked against me. And actually, I was told directly by an admissions officer at one law school that I can't, after I got in, I cannot expect much scholarship aid with that GPA. So, you know, some people might think I'm just being hyperbolic about that, but I, an admissions officer literally told me that no matter what the LSAT score, if you have a GPA that's like under 3.7, then you're kind of in tough water so with what, the what, scholarship. what happened then? That sounds like you were in trouble at that well, point. Well, the LSAT score rescued it. I mean, it wasn't, mm -hmm. a, it wasn't like a horrible, horrible GPA. It just wasn't a GPA that would help. And I, what I think is really strange about this, see, this is the thing about, about law school applications now is the U.S. News and World Report is the king. They have one ranking system, unlike undergraduate schools where they have, you know, 10 different ranking lists that kind of average each other out a little bit. This one has one. Law schools have one ranking list, and they have a formula, and the formula takes into account LSAT score and GPA, but GPA is a raw number. They don't care where you went to school for their formula. So the law schools get graded by your GPA. So it makes sense that they only care about the raw number, regardless of where you got it or what uh, yeah, classes you they took. They don't factor in uh, 
the school or, uh, or the, this uh, reduction thing you talked about at Princeton? Yeah, they also don't factor in the fact that you might have been out of school for a long time. And so I took a whole lot of pre-med classes after, after college in like 2014, 2015. None of those science classes go into my GPA because it was all learned after the official undergraduate diploma. So, you know, it's, it feels a little silly being 32 and being evaluated based on your schoolwork at age 20 when you did a whole load of schoolwork at age, you know, I hope 27. somebody considered that. You know, my experience is that those gap years are really beneficial to an applicant. And for a so. law firm, you know, hiring in a law firm, that would be a really big positive point. But one thing is clear, I'm not going to try myself. <laughs> did, did all the, did all the, I shouldn't say kids, did all the applicants around you, were they as analytical as you are here today? Not all, but a lot. There's a um, forum called, you might have heard of it, Reddit. So Reddit is like a discussion forum, and there's a um, platform on Reddit called Law School Admissions, which has about, I think, 32,000 people on it. So these are all law school applicants uh, talking about various factors in the admissions process, and the depth and the level of response you get if you post something on there is really extraordinary. I mean, there are a lot of people who make this sort of a part-time job for about six months. And some people, even like the LSAT, you know, some people spend thousands of dollars on prep classes or tutors and, you know, many, many years of preparation. I, I didn't do that, but a lot of people do. And um, it, it's a big deal, this, this law school admissions process. And I, I mean, it takes so much time and energy, yeah. not to mention money. Well, now but we've had a scandal about not... college admissions in the last few yeah, months. Yeah, got I, my L yeah. USC gold well, Did you have to on? pay any money on the <laughs> side here? Did you have to build any buildings for them or anything? <laughs> well, the t-shirt came in the mail, but. <laughs> <laughs> right size, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so uh, you're strictly on merit, and I suppose the, the problem that was happening, that has been happening in, in the schools, really retains more to the undergraduate schools rather than the graduate schools. Right? Um, at USC Gould, that's what they said. So Gould is the law school. Um, and I, people did ask that question. I went on a couple tours there. And of course, USC Gould accounts for the vast majority of this cheating scandal. I, not USC Gould, USC. They made a very important point that the law school has nothing to do with it, that it is all the undergraduate facility that's you know, at risk here. But okay, so ultimately you got into the, what, what do I call it, the, the scholarship practice. The practice of, <laughs> I of did finding negotiating, where the money negotiating is. Negotiating scholarships. Negotiating. It's not as very simple as it, taking it off the tree. You have to engage and actively part. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, so I negotiated a lot. Um, you can take, uh, say, say you apply to 15 schools and you get into 11 of them. You um, can take the, you know, if say one school offers you 135,000, another offers you 105,000. If they're similarly ranked, you can say, well, you know, this, this school offered this, and it might, they might not match it. Sometimes they will. The one at 105 will raise their scholarship to 135, sometimes maybe just to 120. You can do it that way, or and they have to be peer schools. You can't take a school ranked like number fifty and show it to a school ranked number ten and expect them to match the scholarship. It sounds like uh, price it's match at Best mm -hmm. Buy. That... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's there's that. There's the matching the scholarships. Then you can make other other deals with them. Like for instance, you can raise your LSAT score and then boost the scholarship maybe, or you can tell them I'll withdraw from this wait list and then they might boost. The so there's lots of that. things to trade off on. There are. Yeah, there yeah, are many yeah. different tactics, and I found that a lot of them worked. So you, have, so you have 15 schools. Did you get into all 15? I did not. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I, I guess I the show is over now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to ask her which one she didn't get into, see if she answers No, you? I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't want to. I, I, I don't it's more know. important to share what you did do. Well, let's, I, let's just say I found that the results were quite correlated with the ranking. I mean, and very much with my, my GPA and LSAT score. And I'm, um, I wasn't as disappointed by the, I got waitlisted at two of the 15 and rejected at two of the 15. And one of the waitlisted schools, they tell you what quartile you're ranked in. So that eased the blow a little bit. I was in the top quartile of the waitlist. But um, the, the- Guess what, mom? I'm in the <laughs> top quartile of the waitlist. <laughs> Well, it was a slight ease of the blow, whatever. Um. <laughs> so 
anyway, yeah, they, um, I, I wasn't disappointed because I saw those charts that I pointed out earlier and my combination of scores fell firmly within the yellow or red regions uh, for those schools. So mm -hmm. it, I didn't take it personally, really. Okay, but, so now you have the ones that accepted you. Uh, did they come oh, in? Oh, one, one other point for the law school admissions process is it's all rolling admissions now except for maybe one or two schools, but almost everything's rolling. So you want to apply early in the process, because A, you find out earlier, but B, they have more money and more spots left. So there's a serious boost to applying early. Okay. Now you have a certain number to pick from, and you want to negotiate scholarships, and you negotiate. And now do, you, do you wind up accepting, the, the, assuming they're all top tier schools, the, the one that offers you most money? Um, that's a personal choice for a lot of people. I, I, I took a sort of, um, a, I kind of did. Um, Georgetown offered me a lot more money than the other top schools. There were some schools that are not ranked very high that offered me a little more than Georgetown. But um, for this, like the, when you take all the factors into consideration, it was, uh, um, it was a fairly obvious choice, I think, because they did, they did offer me a very generous scholarship well, compared to the others. Aside from that, it's in Georgetown, which is a very pleasant place no, to be. No, it's not. You know? It's not. You, you spent time in Keisha. I, I did. In, I in spent Georgetown. a lot of time in northern Virginia, and Georgetown is beautiful. It's yeah. a very beautiful campus. But, well, but at least doesn't think so. Well, no, yeah. no. What I, what I don't think is that the law school is on the Georgetown campus. So the law school is a separate campus on the other side of D.C. But, yeah, you can go to the campus. They have mm -hmm. a commuter oh, train, and you can mm -hmm. take classes there. But you're pretty much living and working on Capitol Hill it's next to the in, White okay. House, well, next to Capitol the Capitol Hill. I mean, That's not a, a bad landscape a... either. I mean, it's pretty. <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, there's a homeless shelter across the street, but That's aside right. from well, that, yeah. yeah. Stay out of there. Is your family, all the graduates in your family, they work in government? Did they go to Capitol Hill? We have actually a few entertainment lawyers, and oh. the most famous that you'll probably know is Marcia Marshawn Daniels oh. or Marshawn Evans. She was on, um, you'll love this, she was on Trump's show, The Apprentice. <laughs> no. Did yeah. she get fired? She did eventually. <laughs> she was in there for a long honor, time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it is a badge, badge of honor now. It's one of those things. <laughs> cool. So Look she lives up. in LA now or DC? Oh, no. No, Atlanta. Oh, okay. Yeah. They got entertainment not, law in yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. 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 Look so, at Elise, so when, you, when are you actually oh, going? No. When are you leaving for school? It's uh, coming soon uh, now. About you, six you? weeks from now. I actually just got my section assignment today. Congratulations. <laughs> oh. Thanks. That means you know what classes you're going to be in? Uh, my internet was down at home, so I haven't checked. I'm not sure about that. Okay, that's exciting. But the first year curriculum, as you probably know, because Jay went to law school, um, is very set. So you kind of know what classes you're going to be taking regardless. It's very separate. It's very important. I did yeah. tell you the first year is most important because that's when you, you know, show your stuff and get on law review or not. You know, Laura, view your life, your career is made. <laughs> Keisha but knows that. Yeah. Yes. How? Oh. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we wish you well. We hope you do the right thing with this new, you know, weapon you are building in law school. It's a yes. social weapon, call it. It's an economic weapon. It's a political weapon. Uh, it, it's an enabler in many, so many ways, and uh, you want to make the use of it. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Congratulations, Elise. Thank you. Yeah, we'll miss you. Well, I'll be back. Yeah, be back can, for Christmas, be back for summer. So. You can phone in. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no promises She's yet. She's got to steady. She's <laughs> got to steady. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your experiences and getting in. I think it, anybody watching this would benefit by knowing your experiences. Thanks. Well, the, yeah. the process is so crazy and dynamic. It's such a game that we could talk about it for a long time. Yeah, I only, I only want to... Uh, Close with one thing. Property is a big first year course. Mm. And it's a, lasts a whole year. It's lots of credits. And, uh, our teacher, his name is Elmer Million he, at NYU, he, he spoke, about, spoke about Oklahoma. Oklahoma has lots of Indians. You know, it was the end of the Trail of Tears, mm -hmm. as, I, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, it, you know, Indian law defined the place in many ways, defined his property course anyway. And in the final exam, um, he asked us what a Pawnee was. And, and Pawnees are very important in property, in personal property, not real property, because let's go to a pawn shop and all that stuff. And he spelled the word Pawnee with a capital P. Mm. And everybody got it wrong. Because the right answer was a Pawnee is an Indian. 
Mm. I'll leave you with that. Watch out for the trick questions, Elise. <laughs> Good to know. Stay vigilant. <laughs> Thank you for being my co-host, Keisha. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for coming down, Elise. And we'll oh. see you guys very soon. <laughs> Sounds yes, good. Indeed. Aloha. 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 <laughs>